Hey, how you doing? Welcome back again. My name is Pastor Yaqua Shelley, Senior Pastor of the Hand of the Lord International. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Um, we've had the opportunity to share with you over the last uh, couple weeks. We've uh, now we're everybody's doing remote. I thank God for our team that uh, comes and makes sure that we're able to set up here at the, at the church inside of the sanctuary and give you guys uh, the word of God. Uh, as we talk uh, this week, we're going to kind of deviate a little bit. We have been focusing on the first fruits. Uh, on Wednesdays, we actually do first fruits one on one, which means that we give people uh, the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, today is going to be a little different because this week we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that's coming up this upcoming Sunday. And many people call this Easter. Um, the thing that I want to address and deal with, we, I've taught this to my congregation over 10 years. We actually do a play that's called The Seven Places That Jesus Shed His Blood. And our goal is to uh, bring the worship back to Christ and his sacrifice. Well, in so doing that, you end up running into what are people doing instead of uh, the main thing. Well, the first thing that we want to look at is the fact that through the Bible, the, the word of God tell us that, that we should have no other God before him, the first commandment. And so I recognize that the moment we give our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, we marry him. He is the bride. I'm sorry, we're the bride, we're the church, and he's our, our husbandman. He's our bridegroom. So if we look at it as a marriage relationship, we can commit spiritual adultery through adultery, which means that now we take that marriage relationship, step outside of that, and we commit that by worshiping the idol. And we've done that. We've done that. The church has been a great, a great promoter of worshiping idols, and we actually do it on this upcoming week. You will see that many churches and, and, and uh, congregations or, or put signs out and say, we're going to have Easter Sunday. Uh, the problem that I have with, with that is not that Christ did not die for us, not that he rose on the third day. I believe in all of that. I believe in uh, the doctrine of God. I believe in the doctrine of Christ. I believe in the doctrine of resurrection. Um, I believe in the doctrine of eternal state. So from a doctrinal standpoint, I really believe that Jesus Christ came and he took upon our sins and he died on our behalf. Matter of fact, I'm going to do another video dealing with the seven places that Jesus shed his blood for the word of God tell us without the shedding of blood there is no remission means there's no forgiveness. Not only did he shed his blood for us, but he did in seven different places. So doctrinally, I truly believe that he sacrificed for us. The problem is that when the church says Easter, Pastor, why would you have a problem with us saying Easter? I'm glad that you asked. Uh, if we turn to Acts uh, chapter 12, <clears throat> Excuse me. Acts chapter 12, you will see in verse 4 the word Easter. It's going to be one time for those of you who are following along with me, and, and I hope that you are and taking your notes. It's only in one place in the Bible that you see the word Easter, all right? And that is one place is in Acts 12 and verse 4. And I'm going to go ahead and, and read that. And it says, And now, I'm starting at verse 1, Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex the church. He says, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, this is key, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, apprehended Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him unto four quadrants, quadrillions of soldiers to keep him tending, watch this, after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, let's look at this in context. Many people will see Easter here and, and automatically uh, add Passover, but that's not the case. It's meant to say Easter for a reason. You have some that believes that the King James Version really should have put Passover. But what I want to prove to you that Passover and Easter are two separate things. We have grouped them together through history, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, but I want to show you that they are different. Now, notice that Herod, he began to come against the church. He was coming up against the church, and verse 3 says, because he saw that it pleased the Jews. So what was happening is that you got King Herod, you have the Jews, both are very influential in this time and custom, and they had a common enemy, which were these newfound people called themselves believers at this time, later will be known as Christians. They both hated uh, these group of people. So it's like having two people that really don't get along, but they have a same common enemy, and that brings them together. And so that, that is known as a, a comrade. A comrade is a, is a person or two group of people who normally wouldn't be friends, but they come together to fight a common enemy. 
And so now their common enemy is, is the people. And as we see, that was considered the church. <clears throat> Here's the thing. It says that when they apprehended, they had killed, he killed uh, James, who was the brother of John, and they sought to kill Peter as well. Many times when I see people minister this, they jump straight to the fact that God delivered Peter. But if we were to rewind, what is actually going on? Again, I mentioned to you that this is the only place that Easter is mentioned. We see that King Herod, it says that he did not kill Peter. Why? Because tending, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, help me understand something. Is if Herod is uh, persecuting the church, he's killing Christians, yet he chooses not to kill Peter for Easter. What is it? How is it that he is holding up killing Christians to observe a Christian holiday? It doesn't add up. He's killing. He's persecuting the church. Why would he stop persecuting the church? to celebrate something they believe in. The only way he would stop unless Herod himself was believing in this thing called Easter. And that is what I want to prove to you, that Herod was believing in Easter. Well, Pastor Shella, how how is it so? How is it different? Well, first of all, for those who are saying, well, you know, he's, how is this pastor talking against Easter? The issue that, that you're having is the fact that you have always grouped Easter with the Passover. But I want to prove to you that it's not the same. I understand what the Passover is. The Passover is when the children of Israel were heading out of Egypt. And the death angel was flowing through Egypt. The last uh, plague that God set to prove to Pharaoh that he was greater than Pharaoh. I understand Passover. I understand the, the leaven bread. I understand that the fact they had to sl slay a, uh, a lamb that represented Christ. The Old Testament is a foreshadowing of the New Testament. The Old Testament is the Old New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I, I, I totally understand that. I understand that they had to kill a lamb to represent the household, the sacrifice of the household. And they would take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost of the house. So when the deaf angel came, then the deaf angel would pass over that house. Why? Because the deaf angel would understand that a sacrifice has already been made on behalf of that household. I totally understand. Totally understand. Here's the issue. Passover and Easter many times fell around the same time. Okay. So Easter was something that Herod, for a minute, just follow me. Easter was something that Herod believed in. Well, what is Easter? For those of you who, who didn't know, Easter uh, was a derivative of the word Ishtar. Ishtar was another name given um, to uh, Semiramis. Semiramis was the wife slash uh, mother of Nimrod. Nimrod you will find in Genesis chapter 10. He is the first known world leader after the flood. He is the one who orchestrated and, and managed and led uh, the rebellion against God whereby we had a tower of Babel. We had a tower of Babel. They are building a tower to uh, be as gods and to be on God's plane. God comes down, causes everybody to scatter. They start speaking different languages, going around different parts of the world. Here's the issue. As they began to leave, they're still, the, their worship was still Nimrod and it was still Semiramis. The issue is that when they got to other places, they still worship the same people or the same deities. They just called them by different names. And if you was in Egypt, you would know her as Isis. If you was in Greece, you would know her, her as Aphrodite. Rome uh, presented her as Venus. And Astra was known with the Phoenicians. Well, this same uh, celebration of Easter is what Herod believed in, is what Herod worshipped. As I mentioned again, it's just a derivative of Ishtar, who is still dealing with the person of Semiramis. The, 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 the conflict, I believe, is that we, we're, we're not doing our history, even though the text is here. We're just going by what we've been told previously, start doing those things, and we just wrap it all together. That is called secretism, which means it means to mix. And so what, what was happening with the, um, the Roman Catholic Church, as they began to get established, they uh, would then pick up what pagans were doing, rebranding it, just calling it by a different name, keeping the same packaging together, the same practices, but just call it different. And so when we come down through history, it gets to us and we just do it out of custom, but no one really diving into it. So, and as I'm talking to you, many of you that are pastors, leaders, people who are influential 
influential. And just a, a, a person who considers themselves a Christian, you need to know this information. Well, Pastor Kelly, why is it so important? Number one, God says that we should not worship anything above him. And so what as we're going through this time, as we're dealing with the coronavirus, I, I saw a video this morning and I actually wrote this down and made uh, so much sense to me that when people are dying of corona, it's not coronavirus itself that, that people are dying from. It's the fact that it's attacking uh, people's respiratory systems. And there's an acronym that is ARDS, which means Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And it basically means when a condition, it's a condition that stops oxygen from, oxygen from reaching the, the organs. And so what happens that when people are being attacked by the coronavirus because of their immune system being low, it's now causing other complications. And it's through those other complications that are killing people. Well, why is this so important for us today? I believe is that's that's where we are. I believe that we're being fought spiritually. I believe that there's something that is attacking our spiritual respiratory system is affecting our breathing. If my breathing is affected, my my praise is affected. My worship is affected. My prayer is affected. So I'm not saying that if you out of ignorance have been some of the promoters of Easter that that you're going to hell. God's going to destroy you and kill you. All those things. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, could it be possible that you just simply didn't know? No, you, you just simply didn't know. And so I know what the frustration is, especially from a leader, when someone brings something to you and you, you if you were to be honest and say, well, I really never studied that verse itself. I, I've talked about during Easter time that, that Christ came and he died and, and I preached some good messages. We called it our Easter service. And, and Pastor Shelley, to be honest with you, that's when we have our biggest crowds. It's amazing this year, uh, Pastor, that, that you, you, you don't have a big crowd. It's, it's amazing this year you can't have your Easter egg hunts. It's amazing this year you can't do what you normally do. And, and I don't believe it's by coincidence. I believe that my assignment uh, today is to simply bring you to a, another level of understanding. And with that level of understanding, here's what I'm believing. I'm believing that you're going to take the word of God for what it is. I believe that it's going to provoke you to study. I'm believing that as you do so, that you may go back to your congregation and say, you know what, I didn't mean to deceive you. I didn't mean to mislead you. I've come to recognize that in this avenue, things that we've been doing in the past is wrong. Because it's affecting, going back again, we're being attacked spiritual, with a spiritual corona that has been going on inside of the church for a long time, hundreds of years, that's affecting our breathing. There's a certain thing that we want to see from the Holy Spirit, and it's keeping us from having that. Why? Because we're putting another God before him. And just because we do it out of ignorance doesn't escape us from the fact that God cannot do all that he wants to do. Now, am I saying, am I saying that you said you're, you're having an Easter service and the church is packed out that day and people come up and say they're going to give their life to the Lord, it, that God didn't move. Yeah, he still moved because he's sovereign. But the thing I want to encourage you with, I believe there was another move of God that could have taken place had you known what you were giving yourself over to. That before you had your service, instead of having an Easter egg hunt, because you know the history of it, that maybe the Spirit of God could have been stronger. And what I'm trying to get your heart to see is that let's start diving more into the Word and not just take what we've been introduced to through tradition. And say, you know what, I'm going to open my heart to something new and I'm going to open my heart for God to show me something different. So when we talk about this Easter perspective. Let me give you a little background on what this Easter is. As I mentioned before, it's, it's really originally celebrated at Ishtar from the uh, um, Babylonians and, and uh, the Sierrians. And they there was a goddess of fertility and sex. Um, which if you go back to history, and I remember geography-wise, that there was a, a thing called the Fertile Crescent. If you can remember, the Fertile Crescent was that area of land in between the Nile and the Euphrates River. It was very fertile. And those who uh, was in that time believed that if you planted your stuff, they, they was very prosperous. Their crops grow well and, and because it was a very fertile ground. But in that, that they believed that many believed that if they uh, worship the fertility God in, in return, that fertility God would then bless their crop, crops and then bless their finances. So you remember back in the Old Testament that you, you're going to find that you don't see a lot about God and Satan, if you would. You're going to see more of God dealing with Baal. Baal is going to come up a lot. You're going to see God dealing with uh, Molak. Molak and Baal is actually the same person. Actually, this, there is Nimrod just giving different names. You remember when as they was going through 
the children of Israel were about to conquer the land of Canaan. And God told them, do not deal with the Canaanites. Why? Because the Canaanites did this type of worship. And he told them that, look, if you entertain them, they're going to, if you would, in lack of better terms, they're going to turn you out. Because what they did was their worship service were mass orgies. They had what was known as uh, temple prostitutes. Temple prostitutes were individuals that worked inside of the temple. But when people came and remember what the, uh, the, their form of worship was, uh, worshiping the fertility of God, which was sex uh, laced. So when people would come in, they would then interact with the temple prostitutes. They were, the, the males were called dolls, and the females were called the B word. And that's, that's not coincidental, but female dolls. And what they would do and come in and worship, they would make themselves available to then worship, uh, uh, provide sexual favors for them in exchange, believing that they would stimulate the, the fertility of God, which in turn would then bless their crops. We all know that that wasn't true, but I'm giving you the background of it. And you remember when when the, the, the prophet had to deal with uh, Jezebel, who her her dad and her grandfather were what? High priests of the Temple of Baal, the same group of individuals. Remember that he had to deal with 450 prophets of Baal, talking about the same group of people. Remember when the prophets would go through and, and have to tear down the groves. The groves were places of worship. For who? Baal. And so you would see this all, all the time throughout the Old Testament. Matter of fact, there's a verse uh, that's in Leviticus 18 and 21, and it, and it says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire of Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. So notice, even in Leviticus 18 and 21, he says, don't let your kid pass through the fire to Molech. So what was happening, many of you probably be familiar with this, there would be this big statue that had a horse head on it with arms extended. They would carve out a section of the statue and to build a fire. The hands out was symbolizing receiving. And what they would do is take their children and, and pass it through the fire or put sacrifice their children through the fire that was in the belly of this statue of Molech. God said that that was an abomination. And throughout scripture, and I want you to go and, and I can prove to you uh, several different more that he began to tell them, don't participate in that. Well, that's no different than a person coming, um, having an abortion. They are sacrificing their child. And so this is something that was going on on a religious uh, uh, basis. They was doing this over and over again. And so when we study uh, going back to looking at Easter and this celebration that they, they did, is some of the things that you would see that is coming now. Now, before this particular feast that will happen around the same time of the Passover, because you can remember that uh, inside of uh, there's several uh, scriptures that refer to uh, the Passover being the 14th of the first month. The first month was considered April. And then as you keep going and digging, you will find out that it, that it, it moved away from April 14th down close uh, more to uh, the moon. They would uh kind of do the worship, or not kind of, but they would do the worship based upon the setting of the moon. And that is how you would have it on different days every year, because it was more, not on a calendar uh, perspective, but more on the, the position of the moon, okay? And so this, this uh, celebration of Easter and Passover would kind of happen around the same time, and we see that eventually they start being mixed in together to where now the bride of Christ is hollering Easter, when the truth of the matter, we should be focus on the extension of or the manifestation of what we know as the Passover. Now, before this, past, uh, this Easter celebration would happen, there would be a, 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 day, a 40 day of fasting. Many of you, this sound very familiar. Matter of fact, you, you probably said this is what you're going to do because the Roman Catholic Church called this time period Lent. But it was actually known first as a fast of Cyrus, which is Cyrus was also another name for the uh, Semiramis, who was also Ishtar. It was known as a, the fasting of Cyrus. And, and, it, and, and if you do your research, you're going to find out that it was connected to saying that she fast and she mourned over the death of Nimrod for 40 days. So and then that led to that when they began to do this festival, that now they went through a 40 day fast and peace. But look at the, the, the parallel to this. They were fast for 40 days, but during the 40 days of those who participated in Easter, they was, they was asked not to have any sexual intercourse for those 40 days. They was asked to, watch this, refrain from doing the thing that you find yourself being overwhelmed to do the most. 
You see the parallel in that. Now, the Roman Catholic Church uh, came back and said, well, you just refrain from whatever it is that you want to do, that you normally would do, whether it be getting coffee every day, whether it be indulging in chocolate, all kind of different things like that. And all they did was change what they what was going on with this festival and then just rebrand it. And so, but what they would do is 40 days of fasting, uh, mourning. If you read through scripture, you would see that they say that they mourn for Tammuz and, 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 and it's referring back to Tammuz. Moose was considered the offspring of Nimrod and Semiramis that they fast for, they, they mourn for Tammuz. And so he said that was also an abomination. And so now they would go on this 40 day fast. After this fast was over, then they would commemorate and come together and have these, these real uh, big mass orgies, okay? And you remember what I talked about before that as they worship Baal, their worship service was considered were mass orgies. They they would get together as they was was uh, commemorating the uniting of Nimrod and Semiramis. That as they came back together through both uh, through this uh, death resurrection type thing, then they would all come together and have this mass orgy. So this is what Easter actually consists of as well. But prior to they would go on this forty day fast. So I would have people ask, so Pastor, what you gonna do for Lent? I don't do Lent. And you get this shot like how you don't do Lent. Because the truth of the matter is, I believe that fasting is something that, that should be continual. As, and Paul declared this. And for those of us that are in ministry, he says that while I preach to others, I put, uh, let me digress. He said, while I put my body on the subjection, I, I, I that, I, that while I preach to others, I myself may not become a castaway. So he encourages the fact that you should be fasting on a continual basis, putting your flesh up on the subjection so that you don't mislead people. Well, when we look at this fasting piece, it would then come into this place. Then they would have this Easter. This Easter festival would then be this mass orgy that all these people who have been waiting to sustain themselves would then come together. They would come together worshiping Baal. They would come together worshiping, worshiping Ishtar. They would come together worshiping Molech. And here's what they would do. The, the, the high priest of this particular re religion would then offer up uh, virgins. They would have virgins that they would then um, already consecrate or set them aside. They would uh, publicly have uh, sex with them out in the open. That virgin then, she is sacrificing her virginity and her life uh, for what she believed in. And these high priests would, would, would uh, have sex with these virgins, sacrifice their virginity, as well as their lives in many cases. And also, people would bring their children to be offered up the Molech, okay? And so when they would kill these uh, kids, they would kill these kids and kill so many that the blood of the children would, would be uh, a lot of it. And they also would use from symbols. This is where the symbols of the eggs and the bunnies come from, okay? And, and those of us that do it and try to justify bunnies and eggs and basket and Easter egg hunts. The thing I want to challenge you with, just show me in the Bible where that is needed. So it's not biblical. It's something that you picked up along the way. And I understand you. It's just a tradition. That's just how you grew up. So you continue to do it. Somebody on your staff, somebody in your church said, Pastor, why, why don't we have an Easter egg hunt for the kids? And so here's the thing that you got to understand. So they had eggs that they would use. But guess how the egg dying process came? It came by way that it started with the blood of these children that was being sacrificed. The eggs would then be dipped in that, that blood, turning the eggs red. That's how the egg dying process came. So even though innocently you're, you're grabbing a group of individuals, y'all are volunteering y'all time, you're spending days uh, dying all these eggs because you want the kids to have a great Easter egg hunt. But have you ever wondered, well, where did that come from? If, it, if it's not in the Bible, where's that coming from? It's coming from a practice that was already here. But here's how the, uh, the dying of the eggs came. Now, now we know that people are now using these spring colors. They turn the eggs pink. Pink, if you add red and white, you end up with pink. Uh, and that's not by coincidence. That's one of the major colors of Easter. But now it's blue, yellow, and all these different things. Just because you change the color does not mean that you change the practice. And what I want you to understand, simply because you're ignorant, does not escape you from the, of what you're doing and you're keeping this custom going. And so what they would do uh, as well, they would offer up these children. Now, here's the thing that I want you to understand. They would have these mass orgies with the intent and hope that people would get pregnant as a result of this mass orgy and this festival that would go on for days. And, and here's the thing. If you have these men and women that just randomly sleeping around with different people, if the women conceive, they, chances are they would not know who the father was. Okay. Nine months, and let's use what we're going through now. I truly believe in, in the midst of this coronavirus that, that a lot of people are going to come up out of this thing 
pregnant. I believe that a lot of babies are going to be born at the end of the year, the beginning of, of next year, all the way through. Here's the thing. Let's look at the same, same time frame. So this mass orgy goes on for days. People get pregnant. They start having the babies at the end of the year, the beginning of the year. By the time we roll over to Easter again, it's easier for that person to sacrifice that child. Why? Because there's no emotional attachment to the child. The child came by way of what? Casual sex. Most of people that I've known know of who even have abortions, they're able to, dis, to, to detach themselves from the, having the child. Why? Because in some kind of form, they got the baby out of illegitimate means. So if I don't have a relationship with the woman that I'm with, she's not my wife, I, I don't love her, we're just having casual sex, she comes to me and says she's pregnant, it's easier for me to say, well, let's get rid of it because there's no emotional attachment. Once we go through with that abortion process, we're actually sacrificing that child of Mole. And so as I'm telling you this, some people are like, well, how, how can you do that? That doesn't make any sense. Well, if you ever had an abortion, you've done it. How, and if you look back over, how were you able to have the abortion? Because of the lack of the emotional attachment with the person that you had the child with. And so this thing keep perpetuating. And so what they would do is offer up this child and the, 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 the children that be conceived this year would be the same children that would be offered up the following year. And so you would have this cycle going over and over again at this time of Easter. And so when we read in Acts 12 that Herod, King Herod, did not kill Peter because he intended to celebrate Easter or because Easter was going on inside of the ecclesia, the church. We're saying he's holding back because of how we see Easter. No, he's holding back because it was something that he participated in. He was not a Christian. He was not a believer. He was killing the church. He stopped because it was something that he enjoyed doing. He stopped it because it was something that he did. He stopped it was because of something that he believed in. And what I'm trying to bring attention to, to those of you that are listening now, we have to be careful when we begin to promote something uh, from the church that actually has pagan roots to it. So my preference is that if you ever watch our stuff, and we've been doing this for over a decade, we don't say we're having an Easter service. You know, we, we say we're, ha we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ, resurrection day. And here's why we do it, not to be a, a rebel or to, to try to stand out. The truth of the matter is I believe that a lot of people are being dealt with from a, a leader perspective. And I want to deal with uh, my pastor friend uh, who is listening now. And as I'm sharing this information, your heart is sinking. And I believe part of the reason your heart is sinking is because of that. And I, I said where you said, too, you, you shared things with people. You said God told you gave you the messages that you preached. Now it's a strong possibility you could have been leading people astray and, you, and you're afraid of that. Because what comes into your heart right now, and I've been there too, if, if I was wrong about this, what else have I been wrong about? And so you have a fear of maybe I've been misleading people. Well, what I want to say to you is it, it's better uh, to be right than to be light. Um, if you research like I'm asking you to do, you're going to find the very same thing that I'm telling you even more. I could go more into detail how Christmas, had, Christmas had, um, it's not Christmas, but Easter has nothing to do with hats, uh, new clothes, Easter bunnies, things on that perspective. Oh, I forgot to mention, with the Easter bunny piece, just real quick how, how that came about, that they believe that uh, Sima Raymond, she died, but she is known you, when you search her out as the Queen of Heaven. And it's amazing that the Catholic Church also says that about Mary, that she actually came down in the form of an egg. Uh, landed in the Euphrates or Nile River, can't remember which one. But when she then lands in the river, she comes out of the river as a bunny. That's how the bunnies and the eggs came about. And bunnies are known as very fertile creatures. They, you know, considered creatures that reproduce, have a high sex drive. So that is how that came about. So what I want to do is encourage your heart that as you move forward, um, before you put something out, make sure you own it. Make sure that you write about it. Make sure you researched it. Do I believe that Christ died for us? Absolutely. But, but I believe that his death, burial, and resurrection was an extension of the Passover, the slaying of a lamb that was blameless, to that his blood in me receiving him represents my household. And as things come, Corona, I'm believing God that through the sacrifice of Christ that his blood will cover me from any death angel that comes.
And what we're believing in our Christian faith that we're believing that the blood of Jesus is keeping us from any hurt, harm, or danger. Not to say that no one in your family will uh, contract corona. Uh, what we're believing that if they do, that through Isaiah 53, by his stripes we're healed. And, uh, but it's through our commitment to Christ that we're believing that's what's going to keep us. Now, I'm not saying that we'd be foolish and we go outside and, and do reckless things, but what we're believing is that the blood of Jesus will, will keep us, not just us personally, but also everyone that's connected to us through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to pray for that person now that this uh, video has sparked something in you. Maybe you sat back and said, man, I, I never heard that before. Pastor, I, I didn't know. What, what, what am I to do now? Well, the first thing we have to do, we have to repent. Repent means to turn away from. Uh, we acknowledge, Lord, I didn't know. Uh, the enemy has attacked me, attacked me through my uh, ignorance. Um, but, my, but the Bible says that I, uh, when we are disobedient, that when we are obedient, that, I, that we can undo what has happened in our disobedience. So what I'm asking that you do from this moment forward, just do the right thing. Let it be okay if other people say they're doing Easter and you say, you know, it's Resurrection Sunday for, for us. And hopefully it sparks a conversation. Um, I want you to study this material on your own uh, so that you can get uh, it on the inside of your heart. Um, and if you feel you want to uh, reach out to me, I'll be more than happy to share with you. Um, at the end of the day, I want us to be right. Again, I believe that it's through uh, ignorance that we are not seeing the glory of the Lord in a degree that he wants to move. And so as we move forward, what I want you to do is simply acknowledge, Lord, I, I, I didn't know. Um, I repent. I, let's start over. Uh, let's, let's renew. And repentance means to turn away from. So at this moment, I, you know, I want to walk you through the process of, uh, of repentance, um, giving him your heart in that area. And remember, inside of Scripture, he tells Israel to give me your whole heart. Why we say your whole? Because it's possible to give God part of our heart. And... I'm asking for that part of your heart that you haven't given God that you thought he had, but in reality, you don't. And so as we move forward, I want that to be your motivation. God, I just want to be right. I just want to be right before you. And Lord, I lift up the heart of the person that's watching right now, whether it's in April of 2020 in the midst of this corona pandemic, or is later throughout the year, or is years from now. I believe that it's by your grace that you have given us the opportunity to share. Uh, I strive to be a faithful steward over who you have given us, and we've shared this with our church uh, for over a decade, but you have provided the opportunity for that in which we do here to be extended into someone else's place of worship. I, doesn't, I don't come to you judgmental. I ask, Lord, that the same grace that you've extended to us when we didn't know that you extend to those that are watching right now. And also pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit that as you convicted my heart to change, so shall it be inside of them. I pray that this will spark a desire inside of them to, to research your word more in, in detail. Uh, whether they are doing it to try to prove me wrong today or whether someone is doing it to get right, it doesn't matter. I just pray that it get done. And I pray that, that the scales will be removed off their eyes. I pray that as your word shares that the tradition of man have made the word of God to no effect. I pray that as they come to an understanding of truth, that they will not dismiss it for the sake of keeping a tradition. I pray, God, that as we move forward into the things that you have ordained, I pray that the glory of the Lord will hit someone's heart right now as, as they're listening to me. I fear the presence of God as I'm talking to you. I pray that this will spark someone to, as they turn this video off, they will go into praise, they will go into worship. They will begin to breathe again. I believe that someone who is watching me right now, they, they are facing that spiritually, that, that acute respiratory distress syndrome where they haven't been breathing right. They, they, worship hasn't been what it used to be. Praise hasn't been what it used to be. Prayer has not been what it used to be. But I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you bring healing where healing is needed, restoration where restoration is needed. And I pray that above all things that we will put you first. We want to give you this part of our heart. And as you said this prayer with me and as you came in agreement with me, as somebody that's listening right now, you feel the yoke of bondage being broken off your life. You, you're feeling the spirit of perversion being removed. Perversion means to deviate from God's original intent. The enemy always seeks to allow uh, 
uh, us to move away from what God has ordained. And, and what greater thing the enemy do is to take the very people who should be worshiping God and have them worshiping him. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. But I believe that you're free today, my brother, my sister, my fellow pastor, fellow co-laborer. Uh, I believe that God is doing something inside of your heart, too, right now, whether you're an apostle, whether you're a prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, whether you're just inside of the church. He's ministering to you. And I'm not saying that if your church has uh, previously indulged in these things that, that God is going to consume you and destroy you. I believe that he's showing you this video today. You have stumbled across it. Someone sent it to you because he wants to do something else in your life. And he's using me as a catalyst to spark that fire. I've done my part. I pray that now you do yours. May God continue to bless you, enrich you, and may your life be enriching as well as all those he has used you to touch. In Jesus' name.